I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know that it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. He's now a part of our kind of rotation of scripture readers because he does such a nice, he's done always done, done, done such a nice job when he's read for the children's choir. I just thought, man, that raw talent, you just can't let that go to waste, right? <laughs> Doesn't he do a good job? Yeah. So Hutch, it'll be great to hear more from you. And uh, hey, it's good to be back. I missed you guys the last two weeks. Although, I mean, to be honest, I didn't miss you like a whole lot. Um, <laughs> we were having just a great time in Scotland. And uh, yeah, just, just amazing. The weather cooperated. It was only rainy two or three days. And the rest of the time, it was warm. And the sun even came out towards the end. And uh, as you... Uh, maybe know about why we were doing this trip. It was about two-thirds mission work. I, I've been working with the Scottish Network of Churches about putting together a training program for next generation church leaders there in that country. And that is going to be launching next January. And we just had really, really good work together, kind of getting all the logistics and the plans into place. And then... We had days when Lynn was the one who was center stage, and I just got to be Lynn's husband. Hey, you must be Lynn's husband. It was great to be just <laughs> Lynn's husband, and she was working with her global missionary sending organization to on-ramp a bunch of people who are doing work in, in Scotland and in the UK and in uh, Switzerland and in Poland and just meeting people who are just really passionate about the work of Christ, primarily in Europe. So, great time. And then we got to celebrate our anniversary, which is coming up in September, our 30th anniversary. And we just did the sightseeing, and we ate the food, and we drank the drinks, and we just had a great time. Uh, but it's good to be back with you all. I'm excited to share with you a little bit. Enough about myself. Let's get into God's Word. Hutch shared that with us. And um, just as a reminder, we're in the season right now, right? It's called Lent. And specifically for us Christians, this is a time here as we're leading up into Easter where we really want to focus in on the things that sort of separate us from God. You know, the things in life, the things about life which interfere in that relationship or, or block us or distract us. We get this time of year to really reflect on those things and let God make some changes in our life. So that's why Lent is a time when a lot of people will give up something that they feel kind of symbolizes that distance that they feel with, from God, and taking that thing away then sort of narrows that, that gap. And um, so, yeah, I hope you've been using this time well, and we're going to continue on looking specifically at something I have a hunch that most of us struggle with and which does interfere with our relationship with God, and that is the fact that probably everyone in this room is dealing with stress all the time. It, it's constant. It's, it's going on at work. It's going on at school. It's happening in your families. It's happening, you know, in your marriage. It's happening in our uh, communities. It's happening in our nation and in the world. There's just a lot to be stressed about. Some of us are, are dealing it, with it because of health problems and because of, you know, just getting older. And, uh, yeah, so we're really faced with a question of, of how are we going to deal with this stress and really reflect on that in this time of, of Lent. And so we're turning to, and if you're following along in your Bibles, you want to go to the book 
called Philippians in the New Testament, the book of Philippians. And specifically, we're going verse by verse, chapter 4, Philippians 4, beginning with verse 40 and going all the way to verse 20. And we're about two-thirds of the way through now. We're going to be looking specifically today at verses 11 and 12 and 13. So if we turn specifically to verses 11 and 12, what we discover is that Paul has this secret. Paul has a secret, and the secret is how he can attain contentment in every and any circumstance. He knows the secret to being happy and content no matter what's going on. In his life, no matter how hard life gets, he has the secret that he can fall back on. And of course, if you're like me, I want to know the secret too. I want want in on this. I'd like to know how to be content in any and all situation. Anybody with me? Anybody want to know this? Okay, so Paul, Paul doesn't waste much time. He gets right to it, and that's in verse 13. We learn the secret. Now, what's important... I think to realize right off the bat is it's just as critical to understand what Paul is saying isn't the secret as it is to understand what he says the secret actually is. So what he's saying right away, I think it's so important, is that the secret does not have to do with you and whatever strength and power that you think comes within you that equips you to deal with stress, in any situation. That was not a secret back then. It was uh, three centuries of a dominant philosophy which is called Stoicism. Have you heard of Stoicism? Stoicism was a popular way of thinking about yourself in relation to the world where it basically said, hey, relax. Take a deep breath. Don't get so worked up about all the things that are causing you stress. Instead, use your mind. Use your reason and develop your character, your virtues. And if you do those things, then you have within you all that it takes to deal with any situation and find contentment and happiness in it and through it. It's like when you, have you ever said to anybody, hey, you got this? Have you said that before? I've said it. Saying you got this. Basically what you're saying, it's a, it's, it's a stoic philosophy. You're saying you have within you all that you need, the power and the strength and the wisdom that you need to deal with whatever situation you're facing. So that's not the secret. Everybody knows about that. Paul then turns to what he says has been the secret for him. And it's not about finding strength in himself. He says that it comes from him who gives me strength. That's the secret. That he can do anything. He can face anything because of him who gives me strength. So the question then, of course, is who's the him? Any guesses? Who's the him? Is it yourself? Is it your best friend or your spouse? Is it your doctor or your physical therapist? Is it uh, Dr. Phil, maybe? No? No. How about somebody running for president? Yeah, they can give us strength, right? I wonder who the him is. (laughs) Who could the him be? (laughs) Yeah, and then going to the word secret. You you know how I geek out about the, the, the words of the Bible in the original languages. So we're talking about the Greek here. And so the word that's translated into the English secret is the Greek word mueo. 
And that was translated most often being initiated into the mysteries. Okay, so it's gaining kind of an extra wisdom than you already have, being initiated into uh, what, what the meaning of life is all about. However, the root word for mu, mueo is muo, and literally speaking, that means to close your eyes and shut your mouth. That's what muo means. So Paul kind of is implying here in using this very word for secret. He's, he's basically saying that the, the key here, the secret here, is learning how to mute the voice inside yourself which says, well, surely you got this. It's all you. You are the one that has to deal with this. You're the one that has to find the strength and the power to overcome this situation. It's muting that voice so that you can turn up the volume on the voice of him who gives you strength. So he's the one that you're hearing. Here he's the one that you're relying on for strength, not yourself. Paul is saying that God is faithful. God is real. You don't have to rely on yourself because you know how that goes. You've probably already experienced how faithful you are, but God, no, God loves you. God is there for you. God's got this, and God's got you. And so you can come into any situation and you can be content because you're in the Lord's hands. You know who gives you strength and it's Him. What's interesting to me is this whole conversation here in Philippians 4 is taking place in the context of a larger discussion about what? Finances. Money. He's, if you look at verse 10, he says, I, I'm grateful for the concern that you showed for me. And then if you skip down to verse 14, you, you come to see that the way that they expressed this concern, the Philippian church for Paul, is by giving money to support his ministry and to support him. And so he's giving thanks for that um, because he's an itinerant preacher. That's what he does for a living. He relies on the generosity of these little fledgling new churches that have been started in the last couple years by this point. And um, he goes from place to place and he's completely dependent on these churches to support him. But the thing is, as he is writing these words, as he's writing this letter to Philippi, he's not preaching anywhere. He's not going to any churches. Any of you Paul scholars know what Paul is doing instead of itinerant preaching right now? Where is he? He's in prison. Yeah, we got some Paul scholars here. He's in prison. He's not going anywhere. You know, I kind of wonder. Paul is, is, is going out of his way to say thank you to the Philippian church, but he's also going way out of his way to assert that He's not dependent on money. He, he, he keeps kind of saying this over and over again, whether it's plenty or in want, whether I'm hungry or well-fed, it, it doesn't matter. It, I'm, I'm reliant on God. And, and whenever anybody kind of talks about something a lot, it sort of gives me the wonderment if that's their biggest problem. The one thing they talk about the most is probably, I, I think that the thing that made Paul the most anxious and worried was, was money. And he was constantly dealing with this message that was coming from inside him. It's like, you're, you need to work harder. You need to get out there and, 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 and work at it. You, you're going to go hungry. Your ministry is going to fall apart if you don't get this money. And he is having to face up to that, to, to mute those voices and turn up the volume on, no, it's him who gives me strength. And the validation of that is the fact that God has moved in the Philippian church to support him. So he wants to just acknowledge what's that, what that means 
to him and to the faithfulness of God. So my question is, what's your thing? Is it money? What's the thing that you worry about the most, that you give the most energy to being stressed out about? You, you worry easily. Is it your kids? Your marriage? School? Your job? Your health? Growing old? What is it for you? What is it for you? And, and how do you deal with it? Does, does the automatic prompting is to come to your, go into yourself and find that strength and power within yourself, or is it to turn in faith to him who gives me my strength? You can't travel in Scotland for very long without hearing the name Robbie Burns. Uh, some of you know who I'm talking about. He's the, the national poet of Scotland in the 18th century. He lived uh, Robert Burns. And uh, his verse is so well known. It's oft quoted. In fact, if you go to like the pubs, um, there's a Robbie Burns night often where people will just get up and start reciting his, his verse. And so I came across a wonderful set of verses from, from Robert Burns, Robbie Burns, that I think had to do with what we're talking about. He says, contented with little and joyous with more. Just stop there. What a great turn of phrase, right? Contented with little but joyous with more. Whenever I meet with sorrow and care, I give them a slap as they're creeping along with a good cup of ale and old Scottish song. And if you're under the age of 18, you can substitute uh, soda for ale. <laughs> I oft scratch the elbow, a troublesome thought, but man is a soldier and life must be fought. My mirth and good humor are coin in my pouch, and my freedom's my lordship. No monarch dare touch. Basically, what Burns is writing about here is he's saying when, when he feels stress he slaps it on the bottom and he sings a little Scottish jig and he laughs. Folks, I have found that the weapon that God and, and faith in Christ has given me in the face of stress, the best weapon, the most effective weapon is laughter is being able to face a situation that's trying to get to me and mess me up and saying, <laughs> you know, no. No. It's laughter that is that juncture between muting the, the inner voice and listening to, the, to him who gives me strength. It's that space where we say, you know what? I'm not going to listen to myself because myself is just funny and foolish, and says dumb things. I've seen this over and over in my life, so I'm just not going to pay attention to that. I'm just going to laugh in the face of all this because my faith is in the one who is my strength and my fortress, the one who is at my side, the one who is faithful. You know, sometimes... Um, uh, laughter is a spiritual exercise, and laughter and silence coexist often. It's, it's hard to really rest in God's presence if you are letting the stress get to you and believing that you're the one that has to control it. But laughter releases you to be silent in the presence of God. I have sometimes mixed laughter with tears. I've laughed and cried at the same time because life is hard. It's coming down on me. And yet, I am trusting in the, the one who gives me strength. So I'm going to pray that for you. And I'm going to assign you a little homework. 
to do this week. I've, I've been doing this. I've taken a couple weeks off. Um, so hopefully you've been working on it, right? Do you remember what they are? Pray. Yes. Very good. So th- these, are, these are things to start doing in your life and to see if they make a difference. They come out of these verses that we've been studying. The first is pray. Do you remember what the second one is? Serving others. Yeah, instead of focusing on your stress, focus yourself on alleviating the stress and bringing peace to others. So here's the third one. Laugh this week. Specifically, whenever the stress level is coming up, and it's starting to reach the boiling point, laugh at it. And let that laughter transport you into faith. And see if that makes a difference. Gracious God, we thank you that your burden is easy and light. You are faithful. Forgive us for how we have been so quick to trust in our own strength in the midst of all the things that stress us out and worry us. Our strength is not sufficient. Yours is. And when we come to you and we place our lives in your hands, you are faithful and you, you've got us. Lord, we pray that that would continue this week. When that stress level comes up, we would have the freedom to laugh and to open our hearts to you. I pray it in Jesus' name, amen.